Hi everybody, I, I'm currently under attack from uh, one or two individuals who are attempting to gain access to my name, address, and phone number through claiming my videos are infringing on their copyright. They've posted three claims against three of my videos. LPS 2, The Rights of the Child, Fempocalypse, and LPS Part 1, Men Have an Equal Responsibility. Their claim is that I am infringing on their original works, Femdompocalypse, The Rights of a Child Part 2, and Men Have an Equal Responsibility, which they claim are their original works. Googling of these titles receives no relevant hits. As you can see in the screenshot, to file a counterclaim, I must make personal information, including legal name, address, and phone number available to the claimant. There is no unoriginal material in these videos. Anyone who has watched any of these three videos will know that I am sitting at my kitchen table reading from a script I've written. These are my original works, with no content from other copyrighted works in them. I own the copyright to these videos. The system is now automated. Removal is instant, and counterclaiming requires that I give YouTube permission to disclose my personal information to the individuals who have made a claim against me. This is a disgusting abuse of the system in order to dox me. I know this because there were only two claimants. They don't want to shut down my account. They want me to counterclaim to prevent a third strike and deletion so that they can get my personal information and begin a campaign of real-life harassment. This attack occurred only a day or two after the first highly upvoted, over a hundred upvotes, comment I left on the channel of Free From Thought blogger and popular atheist turned feminist Zom Gitz Chris. According to the people in the skeptic atheist community, there have been incidents of stalking and harassment of individuals in that community who do not toe the FTB feminist party line. Hi everybody, I'm Girl Writes What, and um, I've uh, I hope the title doesn't put everybody off, but uh, someone commenting on my last video scoffed at my assertion that unless our attitudes start to change, society is sooner or later going to reach a, well, a fempocalypse. That is, feminism will eventually help bring about an economic and social collapse. A lot of people are really unable to wrap their heads around that idea because we've all really, we've all been told ad nauseum that uh, feminism is a cause of prosperity, when in reality it's largely, maybe entirely, a, a consequence of prosperity. I mean, let's consider patriarchy, or to put it another way, uh, the social contract of marriage and fatherhood. Um, this system benefited all parties in a world of largely manual labor, much of it since the agricultural age, simply beyond the physical capabilities of women. Uh, remember that we're also a species whose offspring uh, have one of the longest periods of complete helplessness and immobility of any on earth, and whose maternal parent lactates to provide nourishment to those offspring for up to four years. Because men weren't burdened with the gestation, lactation, and care of children, as individuals uh, they, could sus they can subsist and survive while expending only a very small percentage of their capacity to pour perform labor. Uh, when male animals of any kind don't need to do more than survive, there's, there's usually a lot of lying around going on. And that's not necessarily laziness. Um, it's efficiency. It's only smart. Uh, expending more energy on work than you need to, especially when that work is physically demanding and negatively impactful on your health or downright dangerous, is just really foolish. Because women were burdened with the gestation, lactation, and care of children, and because those children have a prolonged period of helplessness, and because up until just a little while ago, women had no real control over their fertility. Women have never really been able to, if they wanted kids, to work at their full capacity for a large portion of their lives. And I'd suggest even that during the periods of extreme vulnerability, shortly before and after birth, they were probably throughout most of history unable to reliably and consistently perform the necessary work to even keep themselves alive let alone their very helpless offspring. The mutual dilemma 
between men and women was that those individual men who only had to expend a small amount of their energy to subsist probably wanted to pass on their genes just as much as the next guy. And those individual women, they really needed some help and support in order to successfully raise their children in a world without daycare, a social safety net, maternity leave, uh, baby formula, safe, easy jobs, offering flex time and health benefits. So a man couldn't have children without the cooperation of a woman. And a woman couldn't raise her children effectively and safely without the cooperation of somebody. Now, I'm going to borrow a bit from another blogger named Rob of the blog No Ma'am and read a portion of his description of patriarchy uh, and lifelong monogamous marriage because he, he really explained it very effectively. When one stands back and observes the whole lot, we see that both males and females have a surplus and a shortage. Males have a surplus of labor, but a shortage of reproductive ability. Females have a surplus of reproductive ability, but a shortage of labor. Now perhaps you can see why marriage is an economic contract. The male sells his surplus labor to the female in exchange for her reproductive ability. The female sells her reproductive ability to the male in exchange for his surplus labor. In order to sell something, you first must own it yourself, and upon selling it, you are agreeing to transfer ownership of it to the buyer. This is the basis of economics, and as you can see, it is based on property rights. In the economic contract of marriage, the female agrees to transfer the ownership of her sexual reproductive ability to the male, and she takes ownership of his surplus labor as payment for it. So yes, while feminists harp on and on that women were once owned as chattel, uh, there is truth to this, because in a very real sense, the woman's sexuality became the property of the husband. He very much was considered to own her sexuality and the products of her sexuality, children. The children of a marriage became his property because he paid for them. Note that while children of a marriage are supposed to belong to the husband, children born out of wedlock are the property of the woman. A woman who is not married owns her own sexuality, and the products, children, of that sexuality are also her property. This is also why, in the past, women were so much more harshly condemned for adultery than men. Uh, women's, the wife's sexuality was no longer hers to give away. This is why, in the past, when a woman was raped, it was considered an act of theft against the husband. Someone stole the sexuality, which was, which was his property. This is why, in the past, it was considered impossible for a husband to be found guilty of spousal rape. How can you possibly steal your own property? So feminists are somewhat truthful when they claim that women were owned as chattel. A wife's sexuality, not her person, was very much owned by her husband, and it was in fact used as a means of production, the produ production of the husband's own children. But as always, feminists are only capable of speaking in half-truths. The part of the women were owned as chattel song leaves out the second verse, which is, and men were owned as beasts of burden. Now, as an aside, one thing I found really interesting uh, reading recently uh, was that uh, an experiment with capuchin monkeys found that once you taught them the concept of money, uh, tokens that fit in machines that dispense food and treats, it wasn't long before the male monkeys were trading their chips in for sexual favors, and the female ones happily obliging them and spending away on things like grapes and jello. And at its most basic, uh, money is, it, it, it represents labor. So the idea that a woman's reproductive capacity is a valuable commodity men are willing to pay for, whether through marriage or through prostitution, isn't a purely human social construct designed by men to oppress and exploit women. If it is exploitation, both sides are culpable. I mean, considering how quickly those monkeys took to prostitution, is it any wonder it's considered the world's oldest profession? It also bears mentioning that an expectation of chastity in women was socially enforced under patriarchy, largely because, uh, largely in the service of women's interests and well-being. A woman who had no husband to assist her in raising a child was bringing that child into the world at an extreme dis disadvantage and putting herself at a disadvantage as well. And it also bears mentioning, because of the gendered roles of patriarchy, men were penalized with a great deal of social censure if they didn't live up to their side of the marriage contract. That is just about the only thing that could earn a person as much scorn as being a slutty woman. 
was being a deadbeat, shiftless layabout husband and father. And it also, also bears mentioning that the lifelong component of the marriage contract arguably protected and benefited women living under difficult socioeconomic position, conditions much more than it benefited men. Men's value in the economics of marriage was likely to increase over time as he accumulated job experience, savings, and property, while a woman's value, her reproductive capacity, peaks at a very early age and uh, disappears long before she'll die of old age. Lifelong marriage protected women from husbands who might abandon them um, when their fertility and all their options uh, were gone in favor of someone younger, uh, from a man essentially using up the best, most valuable years of her life and then trading her in for a newer model. In a sense, he owed her pension benefits until death, long after her primary contribution to the contract was gone. A few other details. Men who are married and have children, especially if they have a sense of ownership in the philosophical, if not property rights, sense of those children, are more motivated to labor at full capacity and to accumulate wealth. Historically, within marriage, when a child is born, a man will often scale up his participation in paid work. And it's been shown that divorced men who have no access to their children are the most likely ones to default on child support, while as access and involvement increases, so does the likelihood of him paying that child support in full. Women are also, for the most part, consciously or unconsciously hypergamous. Even women who would never dream of uttering the words, I want to marry for money, usually have standards of success, even now, before they will consider a man a long-term prospect. The standard is usually as successful as or more successful than I am. And from articles I've read, even from feminists, uh, disillusioned and still single in their late 30s, the idea of settling for most women often has as much to do with income and career potential as it does to do with personality, sense of humor, or how often a guy is willing to do the dishes. So let's look at why this social construct of lifelong monogamous marriage, with its attendant shunning of fallen women, enforcing of gender roles, and placing authority over children in the hands of husbands and fathers, has always been considered so important to society. In order for society to function, you need two things. You need strong backs, literally or figuratively, to perform the necessary labor to keep everything going, and uh, to build the roads, plow the fields, slaughter the cows, haul the bricks, and, uh, and you need people whose job it is to replace those strong backs as the old ones wear out. Men are really good at being the strong backs that were more necessary in the past than they are today, and women, well, good or bad at hauling bricks, they're the only ones capable of generating more strong backs to replace the old ones. It was really in society's interest to keep women at that work, because without modern medicine and other luxuries, infant mortality rates and uh, lower life expectancies required more babies to be born in order to keep everything chugging along. And I think it's important to note that the vast majority of both men and women throughout history, have they had zero access to any kind of education that might help them uh, be able to perform work that didn't require lifting, lugging, and frequently dying. Patriarchy worked very well for society overall because it provided women with the surplus labor they required in order to raise their children under the best circumstances possible, at no cost to anyone but husbands and fathers. And men's ownership of their children motivated the vast majority of men to do more than just subsist, to essentially labor at more than minimum capacity. That meant that a lot of work got done, and the economic surplus generated was handed directly to the women who needed it. Of course, this arrangement would have benefited some women more than others, uh, the women who married rich, I guess, and some men more than others, the ones whose wives didn't turn out to be barren. And it could easily benefit one party in a particular marriage more than another. Um, but for the most part, in its function as the smallest building block of society, it, it worked like woe and like damn. In fact, it's recently been suggested by anthropologists that the Neanderthalers died out because they employed an egalitarian division of labor in a world that didn't lend itself to maintaining and growing populations through equal distribution of labor and equal distribution of risk to life and limb. 
once the hapless, egalitarian Neanderthalers met up with modern humans who had a more gendered division of labor based on prioritizing women's safety. It was pretty much all over for them. And this is generally what's happened to all societies based on arrangements other than some form of patriarchy. The few matriarchies that have existed through history tended to be small, poor, isolated, and pretty much disappear the moment they came into contact with their neighbors. Now, I've heard some people posit that there's no reason to believe a matriarchal society can't be just as successful as a patriarchal one, now that the world, technology, and the nature of work has changed so drastically. I think there's probably plenty of evidence already to the contrary. Uh, for instance, the UK has essentially become a partial matriarchy with respect to the base unit of society. Neither children nor women's sexuality is owned in any way by men. On the contrary, even children born into marriages are essentially the property of the mother, not the father. In addition, single motherhood is a growing norm over there, with about half of all babies born to unmarried women, and at least 20% of children currently living in single mother households. However, even now that we have safe, easy indoor jobs that pay decently, women still seem to require the surplus labor that used to be provided by husbands and fathers, in the form of maternity benefits, if nothing else. They get that surplus labor now from the state. Men contribute a disproportionate amount of tax revenue to government coffers, and women pull a disproportionate share of the benefits. Women also get that surplus labor in the form of forcible extractions through alimony and child support from divorced fathers, or child support from single men who often didn't even consent to become fathers. The UK government has also been rather lackadaisical about the idea of fathers having access to their children. And as I mentioned above, when fathers don't have access to their children, they're generally less productive and pay less child support. Fathers who never wanted children are probably in the same boat as those who were banished from the lives of children they did want, especially since they're penalized for their productivity. The more they earn, the more is taken in child support. So not only are they not motivated to be more productive through a sense of ownership of their children, they're incentivized to be even less productive than they might have been because any surplus they generate is going to be seized anyway. And because this surplus of labor is not willingly handed directly from men to women, that is, because it has to be extracted in one way or another from men, that means a growing bureaucratic machine taking it from men and handing it to women, eating a share of it as it performs that service. I keep hearing the term nanny state used by political pundits, but really, in effect, we have a daddy state. Men pay into the system in taxes and direct payments, and women withdraw from it in the form of alimony, child support, tax benefits, subsidized health care, daycare and housing, government-sponsored after-school programs, income top-ups, welfare and food stamps. Not every woman with children is a drain on the system, but women as a group very much are. Not every man pays more into the system than he takes out, but men as a group very much do. And this is why the system works. For now. Let's look at some of the other costs of single motherhood especially when fathers are completely absent, through the statistical disadvantages to their children. These children face a two to ten times greater risk of substance abuse, truancy, health problems, being abused, behavioral problems and personality disorders, criminal behavior, gang activity, suicide and running away, dropping out at all levels of education, incarceration as youths and as adults, sexually transmitted diseases, having children outside of relationships, and becoming teenage parents. So basically, we have a lot of direct and indig indirect costs attributable to the breakdown of marriage as the base unit of society, all of which will only increase as those last two pesky items on the list, single and teen parenthood, beget more and more single mothers genera generationally. Not only are single mother families more likely to create daughters who become more dependent on government, they also create sons who are more likely to be non-productive members of society. But wait, there's more. When a man defaults on child support, we incarcerate him to the tune of about $60,000 per year. This not only directly costs us, we've also removed his earning and taxpaying capacity while he's incarcerated, and we've also handicapped his ability to return to a productive role once he's released with a criminal record, 
we're essentially paying $60,000 a year so he will become less productive and more of a burden to us. That's lose-lose. Consider also that when a family breaks up, you suddenly need two households and almost twice the money to support the same number of people. All of that money flows upward toward corporate coffers rather than staying in people's savings accounts and helping them build futures. And since women control 80% of consumer spending in the West, the more money you, pay, you put in women's sole control, the more of it gets spent on consumer goods and bonuses for CEOs. The really awesome thing is it all looks great on paper because a divorce actually boosts the gross domestic product. Anything that causes money to change hands boosts the GDP. To the bean counters, the harmful rotten beans are just as good as the nutritious fresh ones. A multi-vehicle collision that kills several people may actually up the GDP more overall through money shifting to and from insurance companies, doctors, nurses, other medical staff, funeral homes, EMTs, tow truck drivers, accident investigators, lawsuits, prosecutions, all of that, than if it hadn't happened at all and those people had all lived to a ripe old age. So a divorce might boost the gross domestic product even though there's little that's productive about it, even though it actually increases poverty. It's the lawyers and their, their yacht salesmen who are getting rich, as well as corporations, mortgage brokers, bureaucracies, credit card companies, and banks. Not families. Once that marriage is completely dissolved, both parents usually need to work at full capacity to provide a quality of life for everybody that will still be less comfortable than it would have been if they were still together. And the really awesome thing is, the more people you have who must work at paid endeavors at full capacity, the more competition there is for existing jobs, and the more power corporations have to negotiate compensation downward. It hardly seems surprising to me that between the flood of bored housewives glutting the workforce after the advent of the pill, and the rise in divorce and single parenthood, wages have really failed to keep up with inflation. At the same time, our demand for the things corporations produce, jobs and merchandise, only ballooned as the nuclear family disintegrated and all those single-dwelling families turned into multiple-dwelling families with twice the consumption rate. The more family is eroded, the more us plebs need both jobs and consumer goods, and the more power those corporations have to up the cost of living through inflating prices and executive salaries, while lowering wages at the same time. Again, lose-lose. And as all of this is going on in the free market economy, the machine required to extract men's obligations from them, to provide their surplus labor to women and their children, just gets bigger and fatter and less efficient and more hungry. And the gap between the super rich and the rest of us gets wider and wider as we find ourselves having to work even harder to provide a decent quality of life to our children. But wait, there's still more. Remember all those kids from all those single mother homes? You know, the ones who face all those vastly increased risks of a host of social maladies that will lead them to become burdens on rather than productive members of society? Well, here's how that goes. 20% of men under 25 in the UK are considered now essentially unemployable. The London riots were blamed on fatherlessness, and that much is true. The false part is in blaming fatherlessness on fathers, rather than on a system where fathers are considered superfluous to their children's lives, other than as ATMs, and also encourages women to force fatherhood on unwilling men by not holding those women fully accountable for their unilateral reproductive decisions. This system has had the effect of increasing single motherhood and discouraging the development of long-term partnerships by skewing the power imbalance fully in favor of women the moment things get bumpy, while skewing the accountability balance even more toward men than it was during patriarchy. Various feminist organizations have been fighting tooth and nail against a presumption of shared custody or equal access after divorce since it was first proposed, and they throw around super scary and super flawed and super one-sided domestic violence statistics to do it. The moment you mention an idea like legal paternal surrender, which would essentially shift full ownership of, and full responsibility for, single women's sexuality onto those women, feminists almost universe, universally take up the cry, what about the children? Feminism scrapped tooth and nail to make no-fault divorce a reality. 
not to make divorce as available to women as it was to men, but to make a unilateral divorce without wrongdoing by either party a legal norm. And lo and behold, now we have 70% of all divorces initiated by women, and the leading cause given is dissatisfaction. Not abuse, not adultery, not even irreconcilable differences. Just, I'm not 100% content. And then they claim that men denied custody and access to their children is sexism against women. And alimony is benevolent sexism, though it's sometimes necessary and therefore too soon to do away with it. Feminists fought and still fight for women's reproductive freedom, but they don't seem to worry too much about the lack of responsibility demonstrated by women's growing penchant for getting pregnant and having children out of wedlock at rates of up to 60% at a time when they have almost total control over their fertility. And despite women having 100% power of decision over reproduction, no matter what the man does or doesn't do or want, very few feminists believe those women should be held 100% financially responsible for those decisions. Not only should abortions be free, but child support should be automatic. Despite having no say in any of these decisions, men are still held partly responsible. And we all are as well, through the increased social spending required to make all reproductive choices on the part of women as burden-free as possible. Reproduction may be women's burden, but it's their power as well, and feminism seems happy to not only indulge any irresponsible exercising of that power, but has suggested and implemented measures designed to ensure every single decision a woman might make with respect to her reproductive ability, whether wise or foolish, comes with as little cost to the woman making it as possible. And let's look at some other feminist initiatives. The pendulum in both basic and post-secondary education was already swinging like crazy in women's favor in the 80s. Yet during the 80s and 90s, feminists insisted on measures like gender quotas, affirmative action, and women-only funding, as well as changes in primary school teaching, such as the whole language method of teaching reading, that raised outcomes for girls relative to boys. Insanely, the whole language method has been shown to handicap both boys and girls compa compared to old-school phonics. It just handicaps boys more. The swinging pendulum was thereby given a firm and expensive push in the direction it was already going, and we're seeing the results now. Men are now the minority of high school graduates, and the majority of dropouts at all levels. They are the minority of university students, there are more women than men alive today with both high school diplomas and university degrees. Women under 30 in U.S. cities now earn an average of 8% more than their male peers. And while quotas, incentives, gender-specific funding and scholarships and similar measures should no longer be required to assist a demographic that is already dominating at all levels of education other than STEM fields and already out-earns their male peers, no feminist organization seems to think it's time to do away with them or to introduce gender-specific measures to assist men. We have prioritized women's opportunities for career success at the expense of the success of men and at great cost to all of us in all of the spending it requires. Let's look at how that plays out in the real world by looking at a very cut-and-dried profession, medicine. Spots in med school are limited because the cost of training doctors is so onerous that tuition doesn't even begin to cover it. Money is given directly from government and private donors to medical schools to cover those in invisible costs. So let's put a dollar value on the cost to all of us to train a doctor. Let's say it's half a million dollars. Now let's look at the return on our investment between male and female doctors. A male doctor will almost always end up working 44 Per hours per week minimum for about 35 years. During that time, he'll pay flippin' great wadges of income tax and provide 44 hours or more per week of necessary service to communities. He's also more likely than a female doctor to work unpleasant but essential shifts, such as overnighters in, in the ER. If he has children, in all likelihood, he'll work more, not less. And with his ginormous income, he generates spending power that pays off in sales taxes, fuel taxes, property taxes, value-added taxes, all of that. If a female doctor has children, she will usually have them within the first 10 years of earning her MD. 
At this point, she'll take as much as a year off and collect maternity benefits. When she returns to work, she will likely work 35 hours per week or less. If she has another child, she'll take another year off, maybe more. Anne may opt to work even fewer hours if and when she returns, usually only during office hours. She may drop out of the workforce entirely at some point before official retirement age. A large minority of professional women have decreased to part-time or ceased altogether <laughs> their participation in their careers within 10 years of getting their credentials. On average, male doctors work more hours per year and per lifetime than female ones. And when a huge percentage of your doctors are women, is it any wonder you find yourself waiting three weeks just to see your GP? On average, we get a lot more out of a male doctor in actual you know, doctoring than we do out of a female one for our half a million dollar investment. And because that female doctor took one of a finite number of spots, we really are talking a zero-sum game. Another qualified candidate was bumped so that she could be trained. And that's not to say that motherhood isn't important or that she isn't being productive, just that she hasn't exploited her expensive training to its full economic potential and she's given us a smaller return on our investment. And while there are plenty of men out there who get university degrees we all help to pay for and then do nothing with them, men are, over their lifetimes, more likely to pay that money back to us, and then some, simply because over lifetimes, men still earn more than women, pay more taxes, and take less out of the system. By prioritizing, not allowing, but prioritizing women in education at all levels, we've handicapped men's ability to be as productive as the system needs them to be to maintain itself. By encouraging single motherhood and allowing women to banish fathers from their children's lives, we're creating half a generation of boys who risk becoming unemployable and expensive burdens on the system as adults, and half a generation of girls who are more likely to perpetuate and exacerbate the problem by becoming single mothers themselves and dependent on the state. By turning marriage into a risk for men that a compulsive gambler wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole if he had two brain cells to rub together, we've motivated men to be less productive than they otherwise would or could be. And by inserting a ravenous middleman into the contract between men and women for men's surplus labor, we've only managed to increase the size of government, its mountains of expensive red tape, and the deficits it routinely operates on. The weaker fatherhood becomes as a concept, the weaker society becomes. Demoralized men in Japan have started a trend called grass-eating, wherein 60% of the men under 30 have no interest in marriage, children, or even getting a job that more than pays the bills. Japanese economists are freaking out over it because women and children still need men's labor, no matter how it changes hands. And Japan's economic dominance was built on the productivity that labor generated. So to summarize, now that the transfer of surplus labor from men to women must go through a middleman who takes a slice of that pie only to get fatter and hungrier, you actually need more and more productivity, surplus productivity on the ground to both provide for women and children and to feed the beast of government. In Western countries, that beast has grown to 100 times the size it was before women's suffrage and has begun pulling out the visa card willy-nilly, pledging the labor of our children to foreign governments to finance the largesse of today. But at the same time, what have we done? We've removed all the motivation men have to become economic generators by removing all the benefit to them of marriage and children. So more and more are refusing to do the 50-hour-a-week thing and are opting for part-time jobs, beer, and Xbox instead. Others are simply so damaged and handicapped by the system we've created that they're incapable of being productive at all. So we actually have less surplus productivity on the ground. And those children we're relying on to get us out of hock when foreign governments start calling in our debts? They're only going to be less able to save our asses with every generation of them raised in single mother households. Men paying a greater share of the taxes is what's been funding all of this. But because of our decision to prioritize women's educations over men's, this generation of men are now more likely to drop out at all levels of education, less likely to attend post-secondary, and already earn 8% less than women do under 30. We're actually handicapping the earning power of the people who fund the system women need 
and prioritizing training and education for the people who are least likely to exploit it to its full economic potential. We're allowing women to banish fathers from their children's lives at no cost to themselves. In fact, the rewards to women for doing so are myriad and tangible. When we know this disadvantages children and generates current and future costs to society, and we are disincentivizing men's productivity by offering them no realistic opportunity for children that are actually theirs, or marriages that will last longer than a few years, after which all benefit to them is gone, while all the costs and obligations remain. And while economists in Japan are freaking out over Japanese men going their own way, men don't actually have to consciously go their own way to bring about a fempocalypse. They don't need to start riding all over the place like in London, or begin waking up en masse to the fact that the male privilege they supposedly enjoy amounts to shut up and get to the back of the line the way it did at the Occupy protests. All that needs to happen is for us to keep right on giving women everything they want and keep right on marginalizing men. And eventually, there won't be enough surplus productivity on the ground to hold up the increasingly bloated system women require, and it will fall. And no, not all of this is the fault of feminism. There are a lot of other factors playing into this fool's gamble. But feminism seems to be the, one of the loudest lobbies out there demanding entitlements and freedoms that cost us all a crap ton and will only keep on costing rather than paying off in return. <sighs> Anyhow, that is my fempocalypse prediction. Who knows how long it'll take to happen, 10 years, 20, 50, but what we're doing now is not going to last. It's just really not. And, uh, and I think there, there's just, we have to change. We have to change how we do things. We have to force some kind of responsibility and accountability on women, or we're going to have to go back to the old system. Because... You know, big dreams of egalitarianism, it ain't worth society collapsing. So, that's all I have to say about that. And uh, I hope that answers the uh, scoffing feminists' uh, question about uh, the fempocalypse. And uh, hopefully I will uh, see you all again. Ciao.